This is Ron Mueller, and I'll be doing your briefing today. Uh, the topic we'll be discussing is what's on your screen. The focus of new audits uh, uh, in the IRS are about to shift to small business owners, particularly ones who are not reporting a profit. And trust me, they do have a pretty good, uh, in fact, they have excellent computer resources. So they're able to ask the computer, tell me everybody who's uh, uh, filed three or more tax returns and, and uh, claimed a loss on two or more of them. And they get a specific list printed out. That's what they're focused on. So we're going to talk about uh, exactly how that audit's going to go, and uh, where your chances are of being uh, of being caught in it, and how to how to either avoid getting caught in it or being prepared for it if it if you can't avoid it. There we go. So that's what the uh, uh, it's it's going it's going to start in just two weeks. The shift uh, of tax audit directly to small business owners. And specifically, as I said, it's those who have not been re reporting a profit, especially if you're a sole proprietorship or an LLC. The uh, uh, S-Corps, uh, C-Corps uh, partnerships will be a little further down the uh, priorities. They're on, they'll be on the list, but a little bit further down. So the top priority is going to be sole proprietorships or an LLC that have not been reporting a profit. And the bullseye is if you've been reporting a profit for three or more years. Three or more years in a row. There are other people who can not just anticipate maybe being audited, but uh, uh, expect to be. So what are the chances you'll be caught in this audit trap? Let's think of this as a, as a target where uh, you've got the bullseye and then you got the first concentric circle outside that and the second and third concentric. So you got concentric circles outside the bullseye. And uh, the uh, small business owners, just, just being a small business owner, puts you in the fourth ring out from the center. That uh, that labels you a person of interest just because you have a, a home based, a smaller home based business. Second, uh, the next uh, uh, um, ring toward um, moving toward the uh, bullseye. Now, the next closer in ring is sole proprietors or LLCs. You move up now to being a possible suspect, and if you've not been reporting a profit l lately, uh, you've been uh, moved up to suspect. And if you have reported a loss for three or more years, you're considered a primary suspect plus suspect and you're in the bullseye you're in the bullseye so that's so an interesting question would be uh, uh why this hierarchy of interest why this hierarchy well it's because first of all audits bring in an average of 37 million dollars every week into the irs can you imagine that 37 million dollars a week that's more than i brought in last week and the irs is down to its lowest number of auditors in years so you would think that would be good news uh for uh, for us, those of us who are potentially potentially going to be audited, uh, but it's not necessarily because they, uh, they they found ways of getting more more audits done with fewer people. They presume they the IRS presume that the twos and ones that's those not reporting a profit and those reporting a loss for three or more years are the low hanging fruit. They assume that those people are the easy pickings. Well, are they correct? That people who are losing money, uh, are businesses that, that are losing money, uh, are low-hanging fruit. And and is is the, is the reason correct? Or are they correct? And the answer is, in many cases, yes. The reason is correct, and that's because why? Because why? Here's why you're low-hanging fruit. Quite often, small business owners do not meet the three minimum qualifications required to claim any business deductions. You've got to meet three requirements uh, to claim any deduction. So if you don't meet all three of, of those requirements, uh, then any deduction that you claimed is subject to reversal by, by in an audit. What are those three uh, requirements? Well, the first is to actively work your business on a regular and consistent basis. Now, that's been uh, uh, defined by tax in, in tax court rulings as being a minimum of, uh, uh, of three to five hours a week. But they want active activity. So it's not just getting on conference calls and training calls and stuff. You got to actually be doing, actively be doing what will bring money into your business, which is going to be selling things, recruiting people, uh, um, stimulating uh, um, uh, people who are affiliates, things like that. So they want to see regular and consistent activity because they want to see that you're working your business like a business. The, the reason for the, all these tax breaks, the biggest reason, is because they want to get you prepared to have a backup plan uh, in the event that you should lose your job. So that's the first requirement. The second one is to have IRS-required records to document each deduction. Now, that's not just an IRS requirement. It's, it's a law. 
that any deduction you claim, you need your uh, when you claim it, you are stating um, under oath that uh, you have the documentation to prove that this expense was incurred and that it was business related. And the third requirement is report a business profit. Now you don't have to. There's a backup for that. Uh, part uh, 3B is be prepared to prove you have a profit intent. Now that can be done, but it's difficult because uh, proving an intent is subjective. It's up to the opinion of the person doing the, the measuring. It's not black or white. So how, well, here's how you put yourself in that category, the low hanging fruit. If, do you have records that will back up or support that you actively worked your business on a regular and consistent basis. Now, you may have worked your business on a regular basis. You may have worked at least uh, uh, three to five hours a week, but do you have proof of it? They want to have some evidence of it. Now, the evidence can be so simple as uh, as having a, a calendar, a desk calendar, and every day that you do work on your business, you jot down a few notes. Uh, and on today's day, I might uh, jot down uh, uh, called three prospective customers uh, uh, 45 minutes. That's it. That's all you need. Just some kind of evidence that you uh, have been working your business. And do you have proof that you have adequate records to support each deduction you claim? Most people don't because they don't realize the importance of this. But uh, uh, I'll show you some ways. In, in the next 30 days, I'm going to send out some emails to you that will let you know how you can reconstruct lost, missing, or incomplete records. But you didn't have some kind of records to claim each deduction. And finally, did you report a business profit on your tax return recently? And if not, can you prove you had a profit intent? And we'll be focusing on that in this web briefing. So the upcoming audit campaign, this really is a campaign. It's a, it's a focused effort um, on the part of the IRS to uh, focus on requirement number three. That's the profit question. Have you made a profit? If so, they'll give you a, pass, a hall pass for now. If you have not made a profit for it, at least two of the past three years, or certainly for three of the past three years, then you're going to be uh, absolutely um, in uh, on their radar screen. So you've got to do one or the other. You've got to report a business profit on your tax returns or be prepared to, pr prepared, to pr yeah, prepared to prove you're trying to. You're trying to have you know, a profit intent. So the highest priority is number three, uh, small business owners who have reported a loss, a business, multiple years of business losses. That could be two, two, three years or more. The reason three is a magic number, three years, is because that's the statute of limitations. That's how far back the IRS can go in auditing anybody for anything. They can go back as many as three tax returns ago. The last tax return you filed, the one before that, and the one before that. Normally, they cannot go back more than three years uh, unless they meet some serious circumstances. Like they, they can, they have evidence to, to show that. Uh, the, the likelihood of, of uh, fraud intent, something like that. So normally they can go back up to three years. But um, so they're going to look back three years and see if you've made reported any profits. They're the ones who are going to have most difficulty convincing an auditor that you have an intent. Why? Because um, if you're if you've been showing a loss for three years in a row, now if if you're able if your your um, Schedule C shows a smaller and smaller loss each year. That's not too bad a thing because it shows you're on your way toward making a profit. You're, the, the, the curve is going the right direction. But if you're all over the board or if you uh, showed a greater loss last year than you did the year before, that's, it's, gonna be hard, it's hard to prove your intent to make a profit. Here's the auditor's position. Here's what an auditor is told by headquarters uh, to, to think. Be in the mindset of this. They're going to assume that one of the purposes of having a small business deductions on your part is to help small businesses uh, start up, small business startups with their startup costs. That's the primary purpose for having these deductions at all. Then they go on to say the purpose has never been to subsidize them forever. So if you haven't been profitable for the past three years, uh, is that forever? It depends on whether you can prove you're still prior trying to make a profit in that. That's not black and white over three years, by the way. Uh, if you've, uh, there's one example of a, a horse breeding business that you can show a loss for up to 12 years in a row and still survive the test. But those are very rare. Normally, it's, uh, three years is how far back they look. And if you haven't been profitable in, in any of those three years, uh, then um, you got a problem. The auditor will say those exact words to your face in the very early moments of the audit. 
they're going to say, look, one of the purposes of having small business tax deductions is to help you guys start up your, uh, your startup business. So the purpose has never been to subsidize you forever. So why are you continuing to show losses for three years in a row? Why, did, why do they say that to your face? They'll say that for one single psychological purpose. It's all psychology. IRS uh, agents, I, I swear, go to bully school. They learn how to bully people uh, psychologically. Bully school says to um, begin the process of intimidating you in the very first, very first five to ten minutes of the audit. That's what they're told to do. They're trying to establish the auditor's dominance over you. They're trying to establish in your mind that you are the weaker of the two parties. It's not necessarily true. Usually it's not true, but it becomes true. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy if you, um, if you let the IRS convince you that uh, they know everything and you know nothing. And you can expect that process of intimidation to go on throughout the audit. It's not just a one-time thing to prove that uh, you know, I have the control, you don't. That's not a one-time thing. That happens throughout the audit. So be prepared for an auditor to say things or word, word statements or questions in ways that uh, imply that you're an idiot because they're told to do that. It makes it e easier for them to extract cash from your pocket if it can get you to believe or doubt your, uh, uh, your integrity. By the way, what if you're not able to prove? What if you can't prove to an auditor that you have a profit intent? What can happen? What are the potential consequences? Let's, let's look quickly at that because that puts into perspective how um, uh, why this is so important to be able to prove a profit intent. Let's say um, you're audited for 2017, the middle line of this year. Let's say you, you're, uh, you're you're audited for 2017 and they find that um, uh, you didn't qualify. Let's say you didn't have you didn't meet those first three requirements. Therefore, you lose all your small business tax deductions. So, and let's say you got five thousand dollars worth of benefit from that. Well, the first thing they're going to do is open up any other open years. That's that's the three-year period. So you go open up twenty sixteen and twenty eighteen as well. And if you didn't uh, if you didn't meet the, the three basic requirements for one year, you probably didn't meet, didn't meet them for the other two years as well. So that means you're going to end up owing the IRS fifteen thousand dollars. This is a conservative scenario. Conservative scenario. So the um, uh, the uh, but it didn't end there. That's not the end. The IRS will hand you a bill for fifteen grand, but then they're going to add interest and penalties to that, which generally ballpark it turns out to be about the same as the amount of the taxes due. But they may add interest and penalties in there. So now you owe the IRS thirty thirty thousand dollars. Again, this is conservative. It could be way more. It depends on how much how many tax deductions you claimed, how much what the value of those deductions were, and it's due within thirty days. What would that do to you? Would that be a serious problem? It is for most uh, uh, small business owners. Most people would have a problem if they got a surprise uh, bill from somebody for $1,000 and they had to pay it by the end of the month. But you're looking at potentially $30,000 or way more. Now, fortunately, though, you can stop this from happening to you. And here's how. It's a two-step process. First, you need to understand the threat. And then you need to prevent it, and then that will let you prevent it from destroying you. Now, what, what we mean by understanding the threat is, let's say in, a, uh, in, in battle, uh, there's a, a, a great book uh, uh, called uh, um, uh, something, in the, I forget the name, but some two in the, in the Art of War. Um, it says that if you, can, if you can find out what the enemy's intentions are, you can prepare yourself to prepare to defend yourself. Sometimes you can even prepare yourself well enough to be the victor. So it's a great value in knowing what the enemy is going to do. The IRS is not about to tell you that they're going to do this. You will not read a news release uh, in the media that says that the IRS is launching this, this attack against you. Why? Because the element of surprise is what uh, enables most victors to win a battle. So they don't want you to know it's coming. But so if you understand the threat, which you will uh, by the end of this web briefing, then you have, you have a shot at preventing it from destroying you. You might even be able to avoid having it happen to you, and if not, at least prevent it from destroying you. So here's uh, understanding the threat. Here's the, st the threat is, uh, is exactly how it's going to roll out. This is the exact step-by-step -step audit strategy that's already been approved. It's already in writing. I have a copy of their plan in writing, and you'll hear about more of that, uh, more of that as I roll out. Step-by-step, -step, here's how the audit's going to roll out. First, 
all auditors have been armed with a, a 64 page how to manual. This is a booklet that, that uh, uh, conduct it, it tells auditors how to conduct a successful audit. What do you think a successful audit would mean? Well, in the eyes of the IRS, it means they get money from the taxpayer. So it tells them how to conduct a successful audit, specifically on audits that are aimed at unprofitable smaller home based businesses. Their guidance looks something like this. It's not, it's not real intimidating. This, this is a 64-page document they're given, but here's how it looks on cover. It's that simple. It just looks like a, a government memorandum. But what's inside? What's inside? This is, this is the top of page one of 64. Inside that uh, manual, um, the, they say on the first page, they, they, they explain the reason of the manual. Uh, it says uh, the auditors must know that um, the IRS tax code prohibits taxpayers from reducing their taxable income through losses generated from activities conducted primarily for personal pleasure or benefit, as opposed to profit-seeking business. So what's all that mean? We're going to uh, we're going to dissect that in a second. Primarily for personal pleasure or benefit, rather than profit-seeking business. If if they assume that you're, uh, or they conclude that your business you're in business. Because you like doing what you're doing. Let's say you're a, an avid golfer, and you uh, you find a way to to claim that uh, golfing is a business expense, so that you can write it off. Well, if the primary your primary purpose is to get a, a write off for personal pleasure, uh, or personal benefit is another one. And personal benefit is uh, if you've got let's say you uh, you make five five thousand dollars in your small business this year, and you have ten thousand dollars worth of uh, uh, tax deductions. In most cases, you can apply those other the extra five thousand dollars worth of deductions against other sources of income, like your W two income, for example. So those are examples of uh, a personal pleasure or, or personal benefit. And if if that that's if either of these is determined to be the primary purpose of your business, uh, that's a bad thing. It's a good thing if you can show that you're a profit seeking business, either profitable or profit seeking. The prim primarily uh, personal pleasure. Is that falls under what the IRS calls a hobby loss rule, which used to be it used to be you can at least write off the cost of the hobby. If it's an income producing hobby, you can write off the costs of the hobby up to, but not beyond the amount of income you earned from it. That part, the second part of that's gone now. You cannot write off the cost of running a hobby period anymore. Personal benefit that's to reduce your overall taxes, as we just said. So rather than a profit seeking business, they want you paying taxes on your profits. That's the bottom line, right? Well, guess what? That 64-page manual, it outlines for their auditors nine specific, what they call critical factors to use in determining whether or not your, your business is being run, run with a profit intent. What are critical factors? Well, it's here are, the, here are the nine. There's no one way to determine whether a business has a profit intent. The IRS is telling their auditor now. That's in the book. They're telling the uh, uh, these auditors that there's no one way to know, but look at these nine factors and is the predominance of evidence as lawyers would call it um, that they're in business for with a prop uh, to make a profit or not. And so you, you don't have to uh, have a check mark next to every one of these nine, but if you have a check mark next to only one, it better be a real important one because they have no, uh, they have no weighting factors. So you can't get like four out of nine, or five out of nine and get it right. It's not that that simple. It's uh, they give them, they give the auditors a lot of discretion in determining what kind of deductions uh, they're going to allow and which one is not. Now those factors themselves are a problem, right? Five or nine specific things. If you don't know what they are, by the way, I'll tell you what they are. Um, I'll tell you how to get that within in uh, by the end of this web, web briefing. Um, if you don't know what those are, then that's nine surprises you're ready for. Those are nine unannounced attacks. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the help they give their auditors in applying those critical factors. So the nine critical factors, but then they don't just state them. They don't they state them, but then they go in to explain how do you use these. And in doing that, what they say this is on page 12 of this manual. This is a quote. The taxpayer, that's referring to you, the person claiming a small business deduction should have a formal written business plan. 
Now, let me, that's the middle of a sentence, but I'm going to pause there. Have you ever heard of you being required to have a business plan? An IRS requirement, a legal requirement? Any kind of a tax deduction claiming requirement? No, because there isn't one. But this is what IRS are telling their auditors that you should have a formal written business plan. In fact, it goes on to say the plan should demonstrate the taxpayer's financial and economic forecast. So well, financially, where do you see this going? You say you, you have a, a profit intent. By when we become profitable? And what's your, what's your plan, plan of action here? Bec and why, why do they uh, um, do this? Because they, they don't want the plan to be just a fancy profit and loss statement. They want to know what your actual plans are to become profitable. If you have a profit intent, but you don't have any plans for producing it, it's kind of hard to convince an auditor that uh, you have really profit intent, right? But then it goes on to state, this is interesting. The examiner should not request the business plan in the initial no written notice of audit. What is that and why not? The written notice of audit is, that's the letter you receive in the mail. This says, Congr congratulations, you've been selected for, uh, for a review of your tax returns from 2017, 2016, whatever it would say. It'll tell you what year and what, uh, sometimes it'll tell you what topics they're going to be reviewing. But it'll set a date and a time and a location for uh, for face-to-face -face meeting. You would think that in that letter, when they're going to say, by the way, if you have a business plan, bring it with you. But no, they're told the opposite. They're told to not ask, specifically told not to request the business plan in the initial written notice of audit. Why would they tell them that? In their own words, here's how they answer that question. Otherwise, the examiner will possibly receive a canned document. See, they, they give you, when you get that uh, initial letter of, uh, of uh, a notice of intent to, to audit, that's usually four to six weeks or so before the actual audit date. That gives you plenty of time to go back and dummy up a business plan if you know that they're going to be asking for one. But they don't, they don't want you to, uh, to have the ability to do that because they want to surprise you with the question. So when you when our auditors told to bring up the subject of a business plan, if, if not in the initial notice of, of selection for an audit, when are they told to bring it up? Here's what they, here's what it says in the book. The examiner should inquire as to whether or not the taxpayer has a business plan during the initial in-person interview. So once you get to the interview, they're gonna ask you a business plan, but it doesn't stop there. It says, and follow up with a subsequent appointment. What just happened is by not telling you they're going to be asking for a business plan, you're, you're already doomed to have at least a two-visit uh, two audit. You can't possibly wrap it up in one meeting because if you say, if they ask you a business plan, you say, yes. And they say, can I see a copy? Well, I didn't bring it with me. Okay, well, we're, we're going to set up a follow-up meeting so, um, in a little while. So when we do that, be sure and bring that back with you next time. So trying to set it up so that you feel like you did something wrong by not having a business plan with you or not having a business plan at all. Now, what's going to happen in that subsequent appointment? When you have your second appointment and you walk in with your, uh, your audit, um, they give more help for the auditors. Here's what they say that they should use in the subsequent appointment. It arms them with this. 144, 12 dozen suggested interview questions. Now, I, I put quotes around the word suggested because if, if you're an IRS auditor and you work for IRS headquarters and they suggest you use these questions, that's kind of bad, isn't it? So they will use these, these questions. And by the way, this is in addition to the nine critical factors. Getting pretty complicated, huh? So you got to have answers now to, to nine critical factors. You got to know what they are and have answers ready for them. Know what these 144 questions are that they, they're already armed with and have good answers for those. Just take a look at this. This is, do you really have to have a, a, a business plan? Well, technically no, but look at this. Here are the first 31 questions of the audit. I'm, I highlighted a few of them in yellow. Did the taxpayer have a business plan? That's one of the questions to ask you. Was the plan followed? Was the plan in, in writing? What documentation is available? Look at this, the next, next batch. Do you, are you, do you prepare budgets? Uh, when and who uh, does expense, uh, record your expenses? Our financial statements prepared. Uh, how often, by whom, is an accountant or a bookkeeper involved? Are there transfers between business and personal accounts, business and personal checking accounts, or are they all kept in one account? And if if so, how do you separate the business from the from the personal? Have steps been taken to improve profitability? 
So if, if you've been showing a loss for the last three years, they want to show that you're doing something during that last three years other than the same old, same old, or else the outcome's going to be the same. Have you made any changes in operating methods? Or if so, what changes? When is profit expected? And one final page, this is still only 100 of those 144. Did the taxpayer rely on the advice of others in starting the business? Did the taxpayer consult with experts? See, that's, a, a, that's really important unless you have prior experience. So if you've done the same kind of work before opening this business and you were successful at it, then you, you don't need to worry about these two questions. But if you're doing something you haven't done before or doing it in a different way than you've done before, you want to make sure that you're consulting with experts so that you're not just learning by the seat of your pants. What tasks does the taxpayer perform? What do you what do you do? What actions do you take in this business? And are the things that you do uh, take more or less time than others in the same line of work? So clearly, uh, that's just some of the questions. But just looking at those dozen, that dozen questions out of 144, they're armed with some pretty serious questions to ask you. And, and a lot of them are leading questions. Several of those questions refer to a business plan, as you saw. Uh, did you have a written business plan? Was the plan followed? If you're losing money, was the plan modified? And, and several more. So clearly, you need a business plan. Or you run the risk of losing all your deductions because if, uh, if, you, don't, if you don't have a business plan, then it's going to be very, very, very difficult to prove you have a profit intent. So you're going to need a business plan. Even though you, you would be correct if you said to an auditor, no, I don't have a business plan and I'm not required to, right? The auditor would have to, if the auditor is honest, and they aren't are not always, um, the auditor would say, no, you're not required to, but, you know, th then the t and intimidation comes again. No, you're not required to, but most legitimate businesses have business plans, and they wait to see what you're going to say. So you need to have a business plan, or you run the risk of losing everything, because they can, if they can show you do not and never did have a profit intent, they can go back three years and undo all the benefits you've gotten from your smaller home-based business. This is true, especially if you're losing money. Now, they don't focus on this quite as much if you're making money, but if you're making uh, how much money are you making? They, they also look at that. Uh, there is a, a rumor out there that's totally untrue that any profit is a profit. You can prove, show you made a dollar profit and that would be a profitable year. No. If they look and see you made a dollar profit, uh, they know you fudged the numbers. You you declined to take some deductions or did something in order to make the numbers come out right because you wanted to look profitable. Now, they look at are you making a serious profit for serious business? This is why the focus is going to be on profit, unprofitable home-based businesses. And it's why the audits will increase dramatically for those in th who have uh, home-based businesses losing money. This is why. This, what, this is what makes you um, the easy pickings, the low-hanging fruit. So you're in the bullseye if you meet these requirements. Uh, have you been filing a Schedule C and, and claiming legitimate business deductions for two or more years? If so, have you reported a loss for two or more of those past three years? If so, uh, do you not have a business written business a written business plan? And finally, especially if you expect to report a loss again for 2019. So when you file your next tax return, if you're expecting to file a loss uh, another year of loss, that just compounds the problem. So those are the people that are really focused on it. that is the center of the bullseye. So clearly you need a business plan, but that's not enough. You need good answers to all nine of those critical factors. You need to know what those critical factors are and what, the, uh, uh, what you should say, what your response should be. You need to know what, what the, those uh, 12 dozen questions that they've been given, what are they, and be prepared with a, with a legitimate response to each one of them. Why 144 questions? Do they need that many? No. Is there a lot of overlap? Yes. Is the same question asked more than one way throughout this list? Yes. Why? Because they're hoping you'll slip up. It's the same reason a lawyer in court will ask the same question of a uh, of, of someone that's um, uh, being uh, 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 that's being uh, te that's testifying. It's the same reason they'll ask them the same question three or four different ways. They're looking for a slip up, and they'll latch on the one that was the slip up. So if they ask you a question and you don't answer it quite right. What, um, if you don't answer it completely or you answer it in the wrong way, um, you, you lose you lose a point on that that question. But if even if you answer it right, they'll ask you the same question two or three more times in different ways, looking for a slip up.
So you need to have a business plan. You need to have uh, understand the critical factors and, and what the answers are. And you need to know what those 144 questions are and what those answers are. That's a lot. bit overwhelming, huh? It sure looked like it to me when I uh, first saw this come out. But you knew I'd have you back, right? So here we go. Wait till you see what I have ready for you. I have worked day and night for some time on this because I know how important this is. This, is, this could be critical. It could, this could destroy all of your uh, tax deductions you've claimed in the, for the past three years and in the future if they can prove that you you don't have a profit and that never did. Or they actually, they don't have to prove it. They can simply allege it. See, the way the tax works is that uh, um, what an auditor says is true unless you can prove otherwise. And you've got two steps to go to after the audit. You can go to appeals and you can go to tax court. But somewhere along the line, you've got to convince somebody in authority that, uh, that the auditor was wrong. If you can't, then the auditor is automatically right. It's the opposite of the American legal system. You're guilty until proven innocent well, when, when it comes to tax cases. First thing I did was I analyzed every line of that 64 page manual. I mean, I scoped this thing. I, 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 uh, I use uh, highlighters. I use uh, magnifying glasses. I studied everything uh, in the 64 page guide. It's an internal use only uh, guide. That's how it's labeled, but it's not classified or anything. So internal use just means that they're requesting people within the IRS and not handed out to people who are not part of the IRS. But if somebody out not part of the IRS like me happened to get a copy, um, that's, uh, that's legal. It's not what they would like because they want to surprise you with this. So they don't want me to know about it, and they don't want me to tell you about it. But it's not, uh, it's not classified or anything, so it's legal that I have it. Then I learned something else. In addition to that 64-page guide, they've been given a sample or an example of what the IRS considers to be an ideal business plan. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So they give their auditors, if, if they ask for you a business plan, you say yes, they're going to ask for a copy of it. And now what are they going to look for? Well, they've been given a sample. So to see, and they're going to want to see how yours matches up with their sample. And they're only given one sample. And there are umpteen different ways to uh, uh, organize a business plan. But um, they were given, they're given one example, and um, they're be looking to see whether you happen to follow that example. The next thing I did was I took everything apart. I, I assessed, interpreted, dissected every one of the nine critical factors and each and every one of the 144 audit questions. I went through all these things. So what would be an acceptable answer, an, an auditor acceptable answer to each one of these uh, factors, each one of these questions? Then the fun began. I should put fun in quotes. I outlined a generic business plan first. One that mirrored the ideal business plan, the example, the sample that Washington had sent every auditor. So it has the same uh, same topic headings, the same chapter uh, chapter headings, the same wording, the same organization. The, the the cover page looks the same as the sample they were given. Why is that important? Because um, we we will we'll know for sure that the structure and content of your business plan is not going to get in the way of it. They're not going to look at it and say, oh, this doesn't look like a legitimate business plan just because it didn't uh, look like the one that uh, headquarters gave them as a sample. Most of these orders have never had a business, probably never will, and so they don't know what a business plan looks like. But if yours doesn't look like the one they were given as, as an example, then uh, they may, even though you have a business plan, uh, rule it out, rule it out of order. So that's why uh, it's important to have a business plan that looks like theirs. Now, just the cosmetics of it are important. That's not enough, but it's important. They should look like... Here's what you want. An initial reaction from an auditor, when you hand them your, your business plan, they should uh, flip open the cover, the table of contents, and flip through it a little bit and say, oh, this looks just like the one that uh, headquarters gave us to look for as an example. Now you're off to a good start. Then I went into the wording of that plan. See, I didn't just do the, the outline, but I actually filled in the wording of a generic plan. It's nothing specific in there. We're going to make it specific uh, and unique to you. But for now, it's just a generic uh, business plan about selling generic products to a generic audience. But I went into that text then, in the text itself, not I didn't add new chapters or anything. I went into the text of that business plan. It's a template. So it's a it's a it's a um, the board it's a boilerplate template with several places for you to insert specific information and that's what builds in that's uh, that, that's what uh, makes it specific to you. But in this template, I built in ideal answers to each of the nine critical factors. And 
I condensed their 144 questions down to, I got the list down to about 50. Found on average, uh, the important questions were asked at least three, sometimes four or five different ways throughout that list. So I, I found, I put those all together. Let's say there are five. I put those five together and said, um, what, what statement could we put into the business plan that would address any one of these five? And then I plugged that in. Then I identified the ideal places to, uh, in the business plan text, to plug in the answers to those questions. So now what, you, what you're going to end up with is a business plan that's going to have answers already written into your plan for the uh, nine critical factors and all the, all the probing questions. But it's not going to be labeled that way. You're not going to have a chapter called answers to nine critical factors. You're not going to have a place uh, where you uh, uh, answer the uh, uh, 144 Q&As. They're assuming you don't have a knowledge of either one of those, and you wouldn't if you weren't here today. So I've identified the place to put each, uh, to answer each question in advance, but I wove it into the wording so it doesn't look like it's something from out from left field. Then I gave the final product the name Audit Defense Business Plan. Now, you will not, you will not see that written on your business plan because you don't want to take into an, an audit uh, business plan that has audit defense written on it. But I put audit and defense in, in, um, uh, in italics uh, to show you that uh, the, the, the one purpose of this business plan is to build, a, build your defenses in the event, event of an audit. Now, but it is legitimately a business plan as well. If you get this business plan and never get audited, first of all, thank God. Secondly, um, use that business plan because it will help you to move toward profit and get way beyond break even and get well into profit. It, it genuinely is a business plan. But in addition to that, we've built in the answers that the IRS is going to ask for, so that you don't need to remember them. You don't need to memorize all those answers. So the audit defense business plan, I call it ADBP. Here's what, here's what it is. Here's what I create for you. It's a, it's a fill in the blanks template that once you've gone through and filled in all the blanks with your unique information, we run it through our ADBP builder wizard, and it cranks out a what looks like a very professional-looking, professional-worded um, uh, document that uh, looks like an, any, any business plan that is done by a professional. But it goes beyond that, of course, because it builds in some other things. Now, about those fill-in-the-blanks, fill-in-the-blanks, for every blank, uh, we're going to give you a cheat sheet. We're going to do one of two things. We're either going to give you a drop-down menu. Uh, when you get to that blank, and, and here, and, and that drop-down menu will have four or five examples of ways you could answer that, uh, you could fill in that blanks. That's just to stimulate your thinking, and you can take them if you want to. You can use as many or as few or none, but you can also fill in your own. But we're also, for those that don't have a drop-down menu, because it's it's not something that uh, there, there are options for, like uh, um, when, when did you first uh, uh, start your business? Well, I could give you a long list of years going back to the uh, turn of the century and going up to the next century. But rather than that, we just have you type in uh, the year. Which we then, once we've gone through the ADP build, uh, builder wizard, here's what you end up with. It produces a business plan that first meets your auditor's expectations of what it should look like. So the glance at it, a look at it, says, oh, this looks familiar. It's like, looks like the one they gave me from headquarters. It provides all the information the auditor wants to say about your business itself. Not, not, not. I'm not even referring to the nine factors or the or the probing questions right now. There are things they want to know about your business, about how you started it and how you how you had the money to to start it up, and they have lots of questions about the business itself. So this will have all those answers, and we know what those questions are. They're able to look for. So we built in the answers to those two also for uh, for you. It's going to provide pre-written in writing your individual responses to all nine critical factors. It's in the business plan. As I say, it's woven in. So you're going to have to know where it is, and we'll show you the, we'll show you where it is. But you're also going to want to have pre-written answers to the probing questions, because if they ask the same question five different ways, as we talked about a minute ago, uh, can you really uh, memorize an answer that you can use for all five different ways without getting flustered? When you know you have nine critical answer, critical factors to uh, have answers for, can you memorize all this stuff? Well, you don't have to because we built in the answers in writing in your plan. It includes a five-year financial spreadsheet. 
that proves you're working towards a profit. Now, why is it there and is that going to be a pain in the rear? Well, it's the, it's not going to be a pain in the rear because the first three uh, years of those five years are years you've already filed tax returns. So you simply pull out the, 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 um, uh, the, the grid, the, the Excel document, uh, has uh, questions uh, down the left-hand column that um, they are identical to the questions that are asked on your Schedule C. So for the first three years, all you have to do is fill in whatever numbers you report on your Schedule C, fill those in. The fourth column is going to be this year. What do you project based on year-to-date knowledge? Uh, what, what do you project your expenses and income will be for this year, category by category? And then the fifth column is, um, is your projections for next year. What are, you gonna, what are you hoping to do next year? Item by item. So that's not a lot of work because you already got the first three are just copy and paste. And the uh, uh, the, the third one uh, or the fourth one is uh, what's this year look, uh, shaping up to be. And next year is uh, is an open open uh, uh, open target. You can put whatever you want to in, in next year's. It also includes action plans that demonstrate how. Because if you have lost money for three or more years in a row and you – if you get if you get close to convincing an auditor that you have an, an, a profit intent, what they're going to ask is, why should I believe that? Why should I believe that if you've been losing money for three, who knows how many years, but at least three, and then you're planning, to, you already told me you plan to lose money again, uh, report a loss again this year. Why should I believe you're going to become profitable ever in the future? They want to see a how to a, a plan, a plan of how you're going to do that, not just your word, because that hasn't worked out too well the last three years. But what action plans do you have? So we're going to give you an uh, action plan uh, to, uh, uh, templates to fill out that will help prove that you have an audit intent and that a uh, profit intent and that you're um, uh, you're doing things along the way to try to improve your chances of being uh, profitable. So let's visualize what your audit could look like. You walk in first and the auditor says, "What do you, do you have to have a business plan? He, is, he or she is going to assume you're either going to say, no. Uh, do I have to? Am I supposed to? Do I have to? Or you'll say, yes, I do, but I don't have it with me because they haven't told you about it yet, right? Now is when they're telling you about it, first meeting. But your reply is going to be, yes, of course, and I brought you a copy. Now, what happened? You just slayed the first dragon, right? You just called their bluff on two of them. you have a business plan? Um, yeah, I do, matter, as a matter of fact. Um, and, and I brought you a copy. So you, they're, they can't do any more with that question. Next thing they're going to do is look at the business plan and see whether it meets the expectations. But at least having one gets you off to a good start and you, you foil their first attempt to intimidate you. Okay, the auditor then starts going through his, his list of uh, nine critical factors and 144 questions. He starts going through that list. Now, will you be able to memorize what's 144 plus 9? 153? Can you memorize 153 answers? Without notes, so it looks like you're spontaneously replying to them? Probably not. Most of us couldn't. But no matter in your case, no matter what question they ask, you're going to have the same answer. That your answer is going to be, that's a good question. In fact, you're going to find the answer to that exact question uh, in the written business plan I just, I just provided you. So you don't have to answer the question. Just tell them it's already written. Yeah, they may say, can you help me find it? And and I'm, in a minute, I'm going to show you how I'm going to help you be prepared for that so that you don't have to worry about uh, where to find it in the in the plan because it's pretty well hidden. Uh, or it's disguised. It's not hidden. It's it's camouflaged so you don't, it doesn't stand out as an answer to one of their uh, predetermined questions. So what just happened? First, you caught the auditor off guard just by having a business plan, just by showing up with one. The layout and contents are going to look exactly like the one they've been given as a sample. So, they're going to, so their first first impression is going to be, oh, they have a business plan, and yeah, it looks like the one that I was told they should have. But then it's going to have built in your answers to all those questions. So you've got no pressure and no fear about um, answering any question incorrectly or incompletely. It is answered. I've scrubbed these answers. They're, they're built into there, uh, answers that an IRS auditor cannot refute as being an insufficient or, or incorrect answer. So we even give you, as I said, a cheap sheet to help you complete the fill in the blanks. Uh, here's an example. 
Two of the auditor's questions are, did the taxpayer consult with experts? And what advice did the taxpayer receive from the expert? So we give you a drop-down menu where, uh, for these two where you can uh, you can choose an answer or fill in your own. And we gave you, in this particular case, we give you six different uh, examples of answers you could use. Uh, the auditor, what advice did the auditor give me? He said, write a business plan that would guide my business to success. Those are key words. He told me to attend all company provided business success coaching calls because that's going to show that I'm trying to continually improve uh, my sales and closing skills. He may say, follow his or her advice and recruit the way he or she recruits because why are they a mentor? Why are they they're your coach? Because they were, they're already successful at something you want to become successful at. Um, they may tell you to, be, uh, to use them for three-way calls uh, until you have your own proficiency. Uh, they may tell you to engage in an ongoing education to enhance your sales skills or business skills, bookkeeping and recordkeeping skills. Now, these are just examples. You could take any one of these or any, any uh, combination of these and use that in your business plan if it's true for you. Or you, you always, always got that last line, others, and it's to fill in the blanks. You fill in whatever you want to in there just to show that, yes, you consult with an expert and the expert gave you good advice. And then I'm going to say, did you take that advice and you're going to be able to show it through your business plan? Yes. So building your defense business plan, how do you do that? How do you get one of these plans? It's a three-step process, not difficult. The first step is set, called section one is that's the fill in the blanks business plan template itself. That's the, that's, those are the words that, that, that this is all uh, uh, narrative uh, that is organized in a, uh, under the table of contents that will, um, that's what, when you fill it in, it becomes yours and you're unique to you and also has answers to all your questions in it. We have a step-by-step -step instruction guide for you and also the drop-down uh, items in most cases. So you get lots of ways of getting uh, pointers and, and directional guidance on how to fill it out. The next section is your five-year financial comparisons. As I say, the, the past three years that you've already filed. So don't change anything. Write down exactly what you report to the IRS uh, because they're going to have the ability to get a copy of your past three years tax returns. So there's no need to change anything no matter how. It's either, it's either good, bad, or indifferent. Whatever it is, it is. So you can't change it. So just plug those numbers in. And, and then your fourth column is this year projected based on year-to-date numbers and what do you do next year. Why why are we doing this five-year financial projection? Part of it is to show them that you know your numbers. Because they will come in with a mindset, an assumption that will say that um, uh, you don't really know where you are uh, financially. You've been losing money for three years or more in a row or two of the past three years. And uh, if I were to ask you where you stand today, you wouldn't be able to tell me. I'd say, are you, are you profitable? And you may say, yes. And how do you know that? Because I got uh, money in my bank account. That's not profitable. It means you've temporarily got some money, but you've also got expenses out there. So they want to know that you know your numbers. And just by opening up this financial spreadsheet, the financial uh, five-year comparisons, um, it's going to show an auditor. An auditor will conclude at, in a moment, a heartbeat, that you know your numbers, and it'll show that you're making progress toward profit. And finally, the, the, the third section is monthly plans of action. Why? Because uh, we want the, the, a business plan could just list the things you're going to do repeatedly all year long. But that doesn't answer a lot of the questions. Some of the questions are, if you continue losing money during the year, are you making changes periodically to your, your action, uh, your, your business plan or your plan of actions to, to try to become more profitable? If you're doing things that are go going well, are you doing things to focus more on those than the ones that aren't working so well? So they want to see monthly action plans because that shows them that every month you're doing an assessment. So the first of the month, you're asking yourself, what do I plan to do this month? You get two kinds of goals you're going to set, activity goals and business goals. Activity goal is uh, an example is uh, I'm in network marketing, so I'm going to uh, conduct at least three business opportunity meetings this month. Okay, three business meetings. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the results goal, the business goal? Uh, I will recruit at least... Uh, uh, at least four new uh, um, distributors from those three meetings. Okay, now, the first three are kind of important. Did you do them? If you didn't do those those uh, business op meetings, then chances are you, you didn't recruit your four people, and that's how you didn't do the work. But even if you did the work, how many people did you recruit? Was it three? Was it four? Was it seven? 
know, what was it? So it, show, it, it shows them that every month, the beginning of the month, you're setting goals. End of the month, you're comparing your actual results with the goals you set at the beginning of the month. Then the last step, you're asking yourself, what should I change next month? Think about that. What worked really well for me? Maybe I should heavy up on that. If I get uh, if I get seven prospects out of three meetings, maybe I'll try holding four meetings next month and and uh, ratchet up your game a little bit. Uh, or 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 you may you may find some things that aren't working very well. I held three meetings, but how many people came? Well, maybe I need to set a minimum attendance. And next month, maybe I'll say I'm going to hold three meetings with a minimum of uh, six people at each meeting, or whatever number you want to use. But change something to uh, to put emphasis on the things that are working and to back off the things that aren't working so well. So the purpose of having monthly business plans, there are, these are several purposes. It proves, first of all, you have a, uh, an action plan. So when they say, how are you going to do this? How are you going to become profitable? Well, here's my action plan. It shows that you uh, quantify the results you intend to perform each, each month. And then you follow you follow your plan. So you, if you say you're going to have three meetings, you had three meetings. They show you you measure the results. Did you uh, did you have as many people sign up as you as you thought as you hoped? It shows that you assess the performance of each type of business plan and then make decisions about the next month's plan. What what if any changes should I make? If it's working fine, you don't want to make any changes. Try it another month. If it still continues working fine, you don't need to change something every month. You need to change something if you're still not profitable. So that's how you convince an auditor that you do have a profit intent. Now, here's today's uh, offer. We're going to wrap this up in the next 10 minutes. And uh, what, what I've got for you is this. Uh, the ultimate, uh, the audit defense business plan package. What's included in the package? I'm going to give you uh, features and benefits. First, you're going to be what all, what all items are going to be in there. What are you going to get in the package? And secondly, then, what's it going to do for you once you have it done? What benefit does it bring to you? So included in the package are the templates, instructions, and suggestions, and guidance. I already mentioned that. Also, answers to the IRS questions are built into your template. Full customer support. If you got a question about, I don't understand this question, or I don't understand if this applies to me, or what do I do if it doesn't apply to me? How do I uh, not, what do I do? We're going to provide customer support for all that. Um, we're going to give you, when you get your, your plan drafted, we're going to check it, spell check it, and, and grammar check it, and all that, and format it, and personalize it to uh, send it back to you to look like a uh, it will look like a professionally done business plan, which it is, which it will be. One, uh, I'm not moving down here. Uh, then we're going to give you an unlocked, fully editable final version, final document. So you don't, if you have something change uh, in the next couple of months. We don't want you to have to come back to us and have us uh, pay us to make those changes for you in a, uh, in a PDF document or something. So we're going to give you a Word document, fully unlocked, fully editable. You can change anything you want to, as many times as you want to, whenever you want. Once you finalize your plan, then I'm going to personally review it for you. I will do that personally, and I'll comment on it. And the, the comments will be things like, what I'm looking for is, um, are there are there little tweaks you can make to the business plan to make it even stronger as an audit defense plan. And if so, I'll let you know what those are. Now, the last thing I'm offering you is that if you are ever audited and the business plan is part of it, and normally they will tell you uh, that um, uh, if they're auditing you, uh, this is one time they may tell you in advance they're looking for your business plan. Uh, I will, I'm going to, if you're getting, if you're getting audited and you, and you had a business plan for that year, I will get on the phone with you one-on-one -on -one, private phone call and I'll give you an audit prep coaching session. I'll show you, I'll remind you, cause this may be two years from now, maybe next, next month. It could be three years from now. I'm going to show you where to find in your, your business plan, the specific answers to the specific questions. <coughs> and I'm going to show you where to find the answers to the nine, nine critical factors and how to use them. So I'm going to get you comfortable with what to expect when you walk into the audit and how to walk in with confidence instead of fear. Now, here's the benefits. What's it going to do for you? What happens when you've got this, this plan? Well, first of all, sure, you're going to improve, improve your tax audit confidence and peace of mind, won't it? Want to make you feel, if you get an audit notice, uh, you, you may not have to shake in your boots quite as long as most people do. 
um, you may not sweat as profusely because you're going to have a little more confidence and peace of mind because you know you're going to know what you're doing. You, you know you did something right by having a business plan, and now you're going to get a coaching session that's going to teach you exactly how to use what you've already done to um, to neutralize the uh, the auditor's in, uh, intent that to prove that you're you don't have rough intent. It's also going to give you insurance against a surprise tax bill. So you know something because you're on this web briefing that most people don't know. And that is if they're losing money in their business um, and they get audited, they could potentially owe the IRS 30 grand or more. And remember, you'll owe it in 30 days. You owe security of getting off the IRS's radar. As soon as you start showing profit, you're not going to show up, show up on that list anymore. If you're on the same list next year of people who have shown, shown a loss for all of the past three years, but you show a profit for one of those uh, uh, years, like this year, you show profit for this year, and then you go back next year and review your last three years tax returns, they're going to see you made a profit this year. You won't even show up. You won't be on their radar. You won't need to worry about it because your business plan got you to profit and profit got you off the radar screen. You have the personal pride in running a successful, profitable business. I mean, how often do you have prospects or, or, or clients or, or, or uh, uh, potential customers ask you, how's this working for you? You don't want to have to lie. You don't want to have to say, well, it's not really working out for me yet. I'm still, I'm still losing money, but, I'm, but I'm, I'm gaining on it. You want to be able to tell them it's working successfully for me. I'm, I'm making a profit. I'm getting lots of tax deductions that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. They're all legal. You may even be able to say, I've been audited and survived, uh, survived the audit with all my tax deductions in place. Gives them confidence that what you're telling them they can do, you, you're doing yourself. It gives you confidence to now claim even more small business deductions. Why is that? Because sometimes if you, uh, if you, if you show a sizable loss, say a, uh, a five-figure loss, $10,000 or more for a year, sometimes some people would decide to not claim some of the deductions they could have claimed because it'll make their loss, even though it'll be legitimate, it'll be too big. You don't want to really stand up like a sore thumb. So they, they, they take a pass on some deductions. But going forward, you're going to be able to claim all those deductions because now you have the confidence in being able to because you're profitable or because you have a slam dunk um, um, effort, uh, uh, plan to show them, convince an auditor that you do have a profit intent. And finally, you're going to have an honest chance to finally break even and then hit profit. It's not just hope. It's not just uh, uh, a, a dream and it's not just uh, overcoming a nightmare it's you really have an honest chance of hitting break even because you're using a legitimate business plan to run your business but you're in total control we're going to offer you two different versions one is a direct sales MLM direct sales uh, version and that one is for any business that where you make money uh, uh, a per, you're, you're, the person who brought you into the business makes part of the make, makes a commission based on your success and you make make uh, bonuses and commissions based on success of the people you bring in, you know, that's uh, that's, MLM, that's MLM or direct sales. We'll refer to upline, downline, uh, customers, prospects, things like that. So it uses the industry jargon. If you're not in that industry, if your small business is anything else, anything other than uh, one where you your boss earns commissions off you and you earn commissions off the people you bring in, then you want the generic version, the small business owner's version. We're going to give you two... Uh, two options to look at. Okay, so if you're ready to trade in your fear and loss for something called confidence and success, let's let's look look at that. If you're ready to do that, uh, then we're going to show you how to not be subject to their intimidation tactics. Are you ready to stand up to the IRS when you know you're right? Are you ready to stand up to the IRS instead of conceding to their intimidation tactics? Because you're not only going to know what you're doing is right, you'll know why it's right. And so with a little confidence, you can, uh, you'll can you do really well in an audit. So how much do you expect to pay for that? For a package that, uh, that gives you all that, saves you tens of thousands of dollars, while accelerating your success of your, of your business itself. What would you expect to, to pay for that? Well, I asked several people that uh, who have online courses and classes and things like that uh, in, in various different kinds of, of businesses. And the... Uh, the most common answer I got from them was seventeen ninety five. Given then that's given the massive amount of audit protection and tax savings that, that you, you benefit from. Um, but I thought that was too much. I didn't think I wanted to charge you that much because there is something called economies of scale, 
And that is if I, if I were to sell this to one person, I have to charge more than $17.95. But I'm planning to sell this to hundreds of people over the years. And as a result of that, I don't need to make anywhere near $1,800 a piece. So first thing I did was I cut the total by $1,000. I brought it down to $7.95. I lopped $1,000 off the top. And then I still wanted to have something special for this web briefing. Because normally you come to a web briefing, you are offered a spe given a special offer, right? An offer you won't find anywhere else except for that web briefing. So I wanted to give you that. So what I did was I took that seven ninety five, and I cut it in half again. That brings your price now to three sixty eight, or you can even do two payments of one ninety nine. So you got your payment down to as uh, um, instead of seventeen ninety five is now down to three sixty eight. And by the way, uh, because this is tax deductible. That's going to bring your net after tax savings down to less than two hundred fifty dollars, less than two fifty. So you're you're going, to, you're going to pay three sixty eight, but then you're going to get back tax benefits to make up about about a third of that, and you'll end up costing you out of pocket about two fifty for all this insurance and all these benefits. But I also want to give you one more thing. I'm a, if you've been to my web briefings in the past, you know that I like offering a decision maker bonus. I do that at the end of almost every web briefing I do. So the first question you you may have if you're new to this is what the heck is a decision maker bonus? Well, let me explain. There's a special bonus that I give to people who uh, who I can identify as decision makers. Why? Because I found that people who can make a decision, they can uh, uh, absorb all the information about a, a, a situation and make a clear decision and make it fairly promptly. They don't drag it out. They don't sit on the fence forever. Uh, they size the situation up and make a decision. Those are the people who tend to be the most successful small business people in my experience. I like to benefit. I like to give a benefit to those people. So I'm going to get, if you happen to be one of those people, I'm not going to offer you a benefit that's going to try to convince you to make a quick decision just so you can get a bonus. I'm going to say if you already have made a decision, if you're already sitting there saying, yes, of course I want this. 365, I can't lose. I got to get this. It's 368. Well, What's going to happen is uh, if you if you qualify, so and if you order now, uh, within uh, between now and midnight, this applies only to the uh, single single payment options. It does not apply to the uh, the, the two payment um, uh, one ninety nine times two um, uh, option. But if you're ready to do it by midnight tonight, then I'm going to save you an additional hundred dollars, another hundred dollars. So here's what you end up with. You're paying 268, which after taxes will come out to be about 100 and maybe 175 dollars, maybe total, instead of 1795. If you do it by midnight tonight. So again, I don't want you to be convinced. I don't want to uh, to pressure you into thinking I need to make a decision now. Decision now, or I won't get that extra hundred dollars uh, savings. Now I don't want. That's not why it's there. It's there to reward the people that already know that you're going to be. Uh, making that you've already made the decision and you're going to be making the purchase immediately. So your other choice, of course, is uh, uh, is an option of two payments of 199. That begins immediately and it runs through 12 midnight this coming Sunday. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see where to order bizplanspecial.com. So here's what you're going to see at the on the bizplan special page. This is what the order order section is going to look like. For the single payment, you got two sections here. The top one, if you order by midnight. Tonight you pay two sixty eight, and you choose which of these two versions you want. See, and here where it says to order MLM version or small business small business version, you choose which one you want. And if you order after midnight tonight, and any time before midnight this coming Sunday, then you, you go down to the second one. And you pay three sixty eight, and I click on the type of business plan you'd like to have. The two payment option is straightforward. It's being immediately. It's it's in effect right now. The web page is live right now. And you, uh, you have until midnight this coming Sunday in order to take advantage of this discount. Then it'll go back to the regular um, uh, um, web, website rates. But you still have, have you get webinar um, special discounts, the 50% the additional discount you get through midnight this coming Sunday. If you want the biggest discounts through midnight tonight. Okay, let's look at how much you saved. We started off with seventeen ninety five, right? We took $1,000 off that. That brought you down to seven nine dollars uh, then we took another half of that away, 50%. We cut that in half. That brought it down to 368 total. And if you buy a midnight tonight, you get that $100 discount for decision makers. And that brings you whoop, that brings you now down to 265 That's a 
total savings of fifteen hundred and thirty dollars, one thousand five hundred thirty dollars you save, and you you take it home for a mere two hundred sixty five. So until tonight, that's two sixty five. If you make one time payment, if you want to take make two payments, there's two payments of one ninety nine. You order it at bizplanspecial.com. So your only other choice other than doing this is to play Russian roulette with the IRS. That means you're going to uh, um, you run the risk of losing all your tax deductions. Uh, I don't want to. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to remind you of the risk you're taking. It's a, this is a decision you've got to make about how much risk am I willing to take. You could lose all your deductions, could lose them for the past three years, and you could lose them for all future years if you've shown you haven't had a business profit uh, intent for the past three years, but you claim the benefits, um, you're going to have trouble claiming these benefits in the future. So there's a lot of lot to lose there. And you also run the risk of owing the IRS at least 30 grand uh, 30 days from now. So the question you got to ask yourself is that we're taking that much risk to save $268. If it is, Save it. I'm not. I'm not trying to get your money. I'm trying to give you a good value. If you say the risk is too high, see, I'm happy paying uh, my uh, uh, my car insurance payments every month, and and at the same time hoping I never get an accident and I never have to use it, because I have this peace of mind of knowing that if I am in an accident, I'm going to be covered. This is the same. This is how this works. Although I have to admit that this has something additional built into it, and that is. Uh, as a byproduct, you get a legitimate business plan that really will guide your business to success. <clears throat> so ask yourself if it's worth it, uh, and you if you can do it by tonight. You can uh, you can take um, advantage of the the best option: two sixty eight till midnight, or one hundred ninety nine dollars uh, times two payments, uh, which will save you over fifteen hundred dollars. That all the all discounts will expire next Sunday, so both the the uh, both the 268, which goes to 368 tomorrow, and the uh, uh, and the two payments of 199, those will both go away at midnight this coming Sunday. And at that point, you'll see the regular uh, website uh, web. I mean, yeah, website prices. Uh, note: You should add 100 dollars after midnight tonight to the uh, the cost of the uh, of the uh, uh, the decision maker special. Oop. So there's your final slide. Um, BizPlanSpecial.com is the only place you can get this. The, the page is live. It's ready now. You can have your materials in, in hand, be downloading materials, and, and begin uh, filling in the blanks uh, before you go to bed tonight. You've got plenty of time between now and midnight. If you want to wait till after midnight, then at 12.01 a.m. Uh, tonight, tomorrow morning, then the price is just going to go to 368 It's still a heck of a deal. It still saves you uh, over $1,500. So do do the one that is best for you. I thank you for attending because you have done something that most people don't even have an opportunity to do. You you know now know about something that's coming your way that could be devastating, and you know you have there's something you can do uh, to ease the pain or to eliminate the pain. So you can choose. Vast majority of taxpayers aren't can't choose because they don't even know it's coming. They're going to get blindsided by the IRS. The IRS is not going to notify them in advance. So you're at the advantage. At least you can choose. You may choose not to get this business plan and to hope that you uh, can survive an audit. That's fine. If you don't need it, don't get it. But if you want the security and if you want the a guide to becoming truly profitable for the first time, I suggest you jump in there and jump in now. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, this is Ron Mueller, and that wraps up this web briefing.